This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. The following Care Lab podcast does not provide health or medical advice. All content is provided for information purposes only. Listeners are encouraged to speak with their health care provider for specific health care advice and are wholly responsible for the outcome of implementing any tips or information presented. Everyone, welcome to Care Lab. Welcome to Care Lab. I'm so excited that we are all here to have this awesome conversation. Yes, me too. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for my terrible, wrinkly background. <laughs> I'm in my I'm in my closet today, recording, and recording? I thought it would be yeah, I thought it would be nicer to look at a my sad wrinkled sheet than my <laughs> sad messy closet. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. And all the listeners, you don't have to endure this pain that we see with our eyes. Yeah, that's true. I, and it is. I, did you guys iron your sheets? Like for my uh, bed? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. No, <laughs> me no. neither. But I know people who do. <laughs> oh, wow. That's very, that's very homely and awesome of them. But I just yeah. can't. It's a lot yeah, of work. I I, unfortunately. <laughs> no. No, <laughs> clearly neither do I. <laughs> so, okay, I have a question. Okay, we have um, Dr. Reshma Kapadia here, who is a pharmacist, and so because in honor of having a pharmacist here, here is what our icebreaker question is: I want to know what are the things that you take, put into your body that make you feel better, that always make you feel better. You know, like, do you have home remedies? Do you have a medication? You're like, oh, yeah, I got to have that because it does this. Um, what is the thing that helps you? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So the thing that comes to my mind is healthy foods, mm -hmm. you know, um, stuff like for the soul, things that help your soul, meaning quiet, peace, walks, your dog, um, so I take in a lot of soul enriching things in my life experiences that make me feel good. But when it comes to a medication, unfortunately, I don't have a recommendation. <laughs> Unless you are having symptoms of some pain or something like that, then of course, med med medications help. But just mm. for a day, um, I think, you know, having a good lifestyle and diet is just what the, I would, uh, that makes me feel better. So I don't hear you saying anything about things that you want to actually ingest besides natural <laughs> things, uh, t unless you have a very particular reason for it. Is that a fair mm -hmm. statement? Very. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Amelia, what you got? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to be boring and basically say, say the same. I mean, I, I definitely can tell the difference in how I feel both in my body and in terms of like my, my attitude and how clearly I'm thinking based on whether or not I'm putting good, healthy food into my body. So like mm -hmm. if I'm eating junk, I'm going to feel like junk, but if I'm doing a good job, made, making good choices, you know, healthy fruits and vegetables, um, lots of like fresh whole foods, whole grains, things like that, then, then yeah, I feel better. And I think, I, and I look better, I think. And I, and I, I, you know, my mental health, I think is better. And I think my thought clarity is, is better too. And I'm certainly, I'm not opposed. Like if I need medicine, I'll take the medicine, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to better living through chemistry, but I also think, you know, sometimes the, the simple, boring answer for me is just like, you know, if you put good stuff in, you generally feel better to get good stuff out. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'll put equals input. How um, about you? This is so interesting because I have a very similar answer. I really appreciate, I'm not anti-medication, but I am definitely appreciate the food as medicine concept. And so if something 
feels not right in my life or my body, then I'm, the first thing I like to think about is what can I eat that will eat or drink that will help ameliorate this situation first. And then if I need to have something else, then something else. So like a good example is a headache, right? I don't have headaches that often, but if I do, the first thing is not take Tylenol. It's I probably didn't sleep enough, so I'm going to try to sleep um, or just rest at the bare minimum. And Mm -hmm. then if I can't deal with it, then maybe I'll take some Tylenol. But for the most part, it's that. And I have somehow convinced my kids that tea solves all problems. And so if they feel like their stomach hurts or their throat is is, uh, irritated or they're coughing or whatever, they don't feel good. I'm like, do you want some tea? And so tea is like a general term, the eye doctor for the situation. So if their throat hurts, this got honey in it. If their stomach hurts, it's got ginger in it. You know, it's just like trying to use other things to help them feel better. And then they just like it because they feel like they're being babied by their mama. So they feel better. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting you say that because in um, ancient areas in Eastern medicine is tea and herbal remedies, which was all they had in the ancient days to help or cure um, and alleviate symptoms that patients or people had. So it was what you're doing is actually a form of medication, uh, a pharmacy that we used a long time ago. So that's cool that you say that because it is it is very helpful. And I feel like we need to go back to that, too. Mm hmm. Agreed. And like, I feel like I'm I'm for lack of better words, bastardizing it because I know there's lots of science behind it and I don't know enough to really be like actually prescribing the right herbs to be doing the thing. But I have my few little things that I would use and maybe I'll get smarter from here. Yes, for sure. Yeah. I also think that like a a cup of tea, kind of what you were saying earlier, Reshma, it's just good for your soul. Like it just feels good. My, My kids are kind of the same. If they are having a hard day or maybe they don't feel good or they just want to feel like comforted, they'll ask for a cup of tea, you know? And it's just, I think it's so much, especially for like kids and their moms, like mom made me this cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when someone you love like does something like that for you, that's just always comforting. It just makes you feel better no matter what. Right. Yep. For sure. Yes. Um, so let's jump into what is, I'm sure, going to be an amazing conversation. I do want to do a little bit of a better introduction for you, Reshma, um, for mm-hmm. folks who might not know you or might not be um, familiar with your work. So really quick here, everyone. Um, Reshma has been a practicing pharmacist for over 20 years. Um, she has her doctorate of pharmacy from the University of Texas, which I didn't, we didn't talk about that before, but that's also my alma mater. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Go hook long them horns, hook them yeah. horns. <laughs> um, um, uh, so Reshma's passion is to help older adults navigate the world of pharmacy and decrease the overuse of medications that could contribute to adverse events and outcomes. To educate people, advocate for safe and effective and minimal treatment to prevent those adverse events and outcomes, and keep people healthy at home for as long as possible. So we're very, very happy to have you here today. Um, I wonder if you would start us off by just giving an explanation of really what pharmacists do, because I know that seems like people know that, but I think that the knowledge and scope of what pharmacists can do is often underrated. You know, like we think of you as just like the person who doles out the pills, but pharmacists have this crazy amount of information in their heads. So would you tell us a little bit like about what it means to be a pharmacist? Yes, definitely. And I am so glad you're asking this question because it is, um, you know, in society, we look as pharmacists as the pill dispenser, pill pusher, um, and we have so much knowledge when it comes to medications, um, what they're used for, how they are eliminated and metabolized in our bodies, um, how they help us, how they also can cause certain side effects, um, which is so important to know as well um, when we are taking medications. Um, so there's so many different roles in pharmacy out there. Um, 
as we know, there's the retail pharmacist, which is a CVS or Walgreens pharmacist um, that actually dispenses the medications, but they are a great resource too. Um, the only issues with that is they don't have the time to mm -hmm. really consult um, in an expansive way to take that time with the patient, but they do have, of course, they went through pharmacy school too, so they have the knowledge. Then there's hospital pharmacists, which also dispense medications to the patients in the hospital. Um, and they are actually very helpful resources for the doctors and nurses there. And then um, I am actually a consultant pharmacist. So I work in nursing homes, assisted livings, memory care, and I do medication reviews for the um, patients in those facilities. And so we look at all their meds and make sure everything is appropriate, no side effect or duplicate therapy, adverse reactions, um, uh, drug interactions, so much more. And then we also maintain the medications in the facility because um, we educate our um, caregivers in the facilities on how to give the medications properly because that can cause med errors. Um, so there's so many roles for a pharmacist. And then, of course, you have your pharmacists that do research and many other areas uh, work in physician offices as well. Um, so it's, it's very, very uh, wide and expansive roles as pharmacists. So um, I love that you asked this because it's so important for patients to understand and caregivers that we are a huge resource to them when it comes to medication knowledge and um, questions uh, for so many things um, that the, their family or they themselves may be experiencing. Okay. I have a follow-up question mm -hmm. based on what you were describing is your role as like a consulting pharmacist. So, you know, you're going in and you're doing these in-depth medication reviews for individuals to kind of, you know, like you said, make sure there's not duplicate things on there, look for adverse uh, interactions and things like that. I think a lot of people feel like, well, isn't the doctor already doing that, <laughs> right? And so, but, so would you talk a little bit about like, why does a pharmacist need to be there doing, why, why is maybe it's not enough just to have your doctor prescribing the meds? Why do you need a pharmacist to do these kinds of reviews? Yes. So, um, you know, as we know, the healthcare system is very fragmented. And that's, um, this, it's similar in the nursing homes. So they have multiple doctors coming in to see the patient for different um, disease states. So um, when doctors do come in, they assess the patient and they may add a medication to their profile. And that may be, the patient may already be taking something similar. Maybe not the same thing. It could be, um, you know, like an, statin medication for cholesterol, and now we're adding another cholesterol medication. So, um, you know, doctors don't always have the time, unfortunately, to do an in-depth med review on every resident every time they see them, um, which is one of the reasons why it's so important to work with a pharmacist. Um, and there's so many other factors as well when it comes to medication management in um, and how um, nursing may uh, nursing may not be aware that these two medications put together can cause this drug interaction. The mm -hmm. physician might. Um, again, we've been through. Uh, we're focused mainly on medications through pharmacy school, four years of pharmacy school. Um, doctors get a pretty good review of medications, but our specialty is med. So we're going to know right off the bat our drug interactions and side effects. And the, the patient could pre be presenting, um, you know, fluid overload, which may be due to a medication versus a new diagnosis. So, um, in that sense, it's so important for a pharmacist to be involved in the landscape of medication management and patient care when it comes to these things because um, we have that knowledge in our mind constantly, whereas sometimes these things can get overlooked 
when there are, you know, multiple issues with time management, um, being available, being able to look at everything. Um, so, or the knowledge base as well of other caregivers in the system, such as the nurse. You, so I think it's such an important point that I want to additionally drive home is that like you have four years of schooling towards this plus 20 years of practice, because I don't know about you, Amelia, but when I was in OT school, we got a one semester pharmacology class. Yeah. And while I do feel like I needed to know that information, it made me acutely aware that like, this is way deeper than this. And yeah. The, yeah. I'm just barely scratching the surface. And so the moral of my story is I need to refer to a pharmacist and I'm going to, if you ask me a question about medication, I'm going to say, this is the mm -hmm. basics, but we're going to go talk to the pharmacist about this because I, it just has so much depth to it. And like one thing that you just mentioned that I feel like people don't pay enough attention to is the timing of the medications. And so mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, um, since that lies very solely or specifically either with the patient themselves or whoever's providing the medication, can you talk to why that's so important to take it the time that it um, says it's dosed at? Yes. So that's a big um, reason, actually, that, you know, it's huge reason for med errors mm -hmm. in our, especially in our elderly population. Mm -hmm. um, understanding that a medication has requirements of when it should be given. Um, so, and it's mainly because of the pharmacology, the way the medication is processed in our body. And that medication is made in a specific way that requires us to take it at a certain time due to the way it is moving through our body. So um, to have the you know best effect for the patient when you do that. Uh, one of the common medications is Synthroid. A lot of people are on Synthroid for hypothyroidism and um, they end up you know, it's taken one hour before food on empty stomach, but they don't always know that or are not aware or they um, know that and they just, you know, want to do what they feel is comfortable. They, maybe best. they don't they don't understand exactly how important that is to make the medication. They're like, oh, yeah, I, I hear that. But whatever. I'm going to do it yes, this way. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Hey there, it's Amelia. Listen, I am so thrilled to have a great resource like Ask Sammy as part of the Care Lab team. And here's why. It's a game changer for aging in place because it makes it so simple. All you do is ask. Just type in your question or even tell Sammy what the problem is and get tailored solutions. Everything from innovative adaptive equipment to comprehensive resources. It's a great way to become more empowered, to live more independently, and to live with greater confidence. And my favorite thing about how Ask Sammy works is it's deeply rooted in dignity and practicality. So whether you're a fellow therapist, a care partner, or someone who's seeking solutions for themselves, visit www.asksammy.com. We're going to link it in the show notes so you can find it there. Start making home more accessible today. Now, back to the show. So now the medication is, let's say, taken with food and is not working as effectively as when we were, were taking it the way the manufacturer needed us to take it. And so now they go back to the doctor, get a lab, see how their thyroid function is, and now the dose is increased. Um, so then we end up getting higher doses of medications, which now can have more side effects. The higher the dose, the more side effects of the medication. So timing is huge when it comes to medications and how they should be given. A um, lot of patients um, also, if it's dosed two times a day, they only want to take it once a day, or they may double up because they forgot a mm -hmm. medication. Uh, we can't do that. That's very unsafe. Um, so there's a lot of education that needs to go behind um, when we do prescribe medications because it's not as, I, I feel, um, unfortunately, people see um, the pharmacist behind the counter and the whole pharmacy system in retail as a fast food 
type of environment and Mm -hmm. it's not there's like Mm -hmm. you said there's a lot more depth to it and there's a lot more education and guidance and then there's also the fact that once they do take the meds they now may be experiencing another symptom and they have questions and there's no one there to answer those questions either so there's a lot behind medications and how we can help people navigate this system. And I just, I just want to reiterate like one more time. You have four years of school just dedicated to medicine and Mm -hmm. how it works in your body and how the medicines themselves are even like built down to the chemical structure. It's four years just on that. Med school is also four years, right? But doctors have to learn, but they're learning a ton of other stuff during that time. So And then, of course, you know, there's residences and things like that. But you are spending the same amount of time that doctors are learning tons and tons of stuff focused on this very specific issue, like getting so down into the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of it. Of course, pharmacists are really, truly, even though the doctors are the ones prescribing, pharmacists really are the experts on these medications, how they work and how they work in your body. So it really like. When you start thinking about that and understanding the difference, it makes sense that you need someone who has that level of expertise to review these medicines that really do have, I mean, they can have huge impacts on the way your body works, on how you function, and on your quality of life. I think that sometimes we've gotten really used to, like as a culture, to like taking medicines and taking pills and like it's been super normalized for us that if you have a problem, you take a pill for it. And, and, and so it feels like it's not a big deal and it feels Mm. like it's always really safe. And of Mm. course that's not like you can use lots of medications safely, but you have to be following the directions and doing it the right way and understanding that it's complicated So you can Mm. be taking one thing, you can add another thing on top of it and it can, and those things can interact and really, truly like no one actually knows about all of that except your pharmacist. Yes. (laughs) So true. So true. And that's such an important point to reiterate as well, because like you said, we, we just pop pills like candy (laughs) and it's, it's so much more to it and it's actually causing harm. Mm -hmm. And now that we have more medications in the market than ever before, um, and, and we have, but now we're start, we have been starting to see in the last decade and, uh, 10 to 20 years, how these medications are now really combining and affecting, especially our elderly. Mm. And mainly because they're more frail and their metabolism is different than, you know, as you get older. So it is affecting them and research does not always include um, patients over 65. It's very few that are older that are included in these research, uh, drug research studies um, before the uh, drug comes out in the market. So we don't really know truly how these meds are affecting them. So there's a lot more depth to medications than just what we see. And um, I think the culture of fast fix as well um, has really harmed us when it comes to medications because it may be a fast fix, but then in the future we may suffer from other consequences. Mm. You mentioned earlier about like your role as a consulting pharmacist and how more than like most of the time we have more than one physician and they are looking at more than one thing in our persons and prescribing more than one thing, but not necessarily communicating with each other or looking to see um, how all these things interact. And so you can see how over the years you might take a thing for chronic disease and keep taking a thing and get added another thing. And by the time you get to be 65, 70, you could be on a lot of different medications. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk a little bit about the concept of over-prescribing and um, the cotton recently I learned that's a 
controversial topic of um, deprescribing medication and like what that is and why that's um, a challenge and why people should know about it. Yes. So as you said, polypharmacy contributes to people and patients um, being on multiple medications. Polypharmacy is defined as five medications or more, uh, multiple physicians, multiple pharmacies, um, and multiple chronic conditions. So um, and a lot of our seniors fall into a lot of those categories. So um and the way our system is, like I said, fragmented, where we have a physician for pain and we have a physician for blood pressure and diabetes. So all of those uh, physicians, there's no common electronic health record either, which is all leading to um, mismanagement or med errors um, and overprescribing of medications in our patients. And so this is a huge problem. Um, and they, so what's happening is they get a medication. Usually if you're on five or more medications, you end up um, adding more medications due to the first original five because of the mm -hmm. side effect of uh, the Okay. So you're like Manage taking another effect. pill to solve the problems that one of the first five pills have caused, and Created. then it just keeps causing more problems, and then like it just grows and grows yeah. and grows. And that's called the prescription cascade. Uh, oh, I didn't yeah. know that's that term. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. is a good word. Yes. Yeah, so that is the whole point of we're on a medication. Now we're on a side of we're getting a side effect of a medic of one medication. So a common one is pain meds. Now mm -hmm. you get constipation um, due to pain medications. That's a very common side effect. And now we're on a laxative for that mm -hmm. uh, issue. So, um, and then that- and you're came, dehydrated. Uh, exactly. That was the next thing. Now is dehydration. So now we're going to be on something else, um, which could affect blood pressure. So many things in our, our body function as a whole. And one system affects another. And- Putting that all together, I think, is so important for the patient and to, um, add, and that's one of the things I wanted to educate on and advocate for in our seniors, especially, is to ask, do I need to be on this med? Is it mm. still needed for me? Or is, because we go under the impression that a med, once we get prescribed something, it's forever. And mm -hmm. it's not forever. And some common things don't always even have to be forever, um, so, uh, like your GI medications to help with reflux. That is not needed forever, but a lot of the, our seniors are on that forever. Mm. Um, and now we're and we're seeing dementia caused uh, or leading uh, due to use overuse of our GI medications. Um, some infections due to that. So there's a lot of things coming out about what, when you use a medication too long, now what can happen from that? Not only the side effect of it, but now we're seeing other results occurring because we've used the medication longer than what it was studied for. Um, can I just say like, that's nuts. I actually didn't know. And I had heard recently and like read some articles about you know, long-term use of, of some of those kinds of GI meds and how they affect our gut and how that affects other things. But I had not heard that we're finding evidence that it can lead to onset of dementia symptoms. Like that's, mm -hmm. that yeah, is cause crazy pants. Yes. Cause uh, you know, it's G it's for the gut. Right. And mm -hmm. so it's affecting your lining and the lining affects what nutrients you absorb. Mm. So now your mm. nutrients are really important in your body for brain function. And now we have some cognitive issues or um, confusion or memory loss. Mm -hmm. And we make sense get diagnosed with dementia. Yeah. Uh, when all we need to do is maybe try that GI med and see if we can get off of it wow. and get our nutrition back. And see if that helps us and instead of adding another medication for dementia. Yeah. Whoa. 
and, and just for my curiosity, that information that's coming out now, that's after having taken like a GERD medicine for how many years? Did they say so like, the time frame? For taking a PPI, which is a medication for reflux, is about eight weeks. So you're saying after taking it for eight weeks, you can after start to eight, mess with the lining and all the yes. cascade that you just well, said? That Probably dementia, I would assume, would be a lot longer. Okay. But when you when you start talking about possibility of having C diff um, uh. and pneumonia start occurring in patients, that may be a medication you want to look at to see. Oh. Okay, yeah. this is now causing us to get C diff or pneumonia, other infections. Is that possible that let's look and see if this PPI is or the GI medication is causing that? Because it messes with the it messes with the acidity level of your gut, right? So it's going to change what kind of bacteria can grow in there. And of course, like we we want our gut needs to have Correct. its own like microbiome. Yeah, microbiome. It's it's got bacteria and other flora in there that it needs to have. When we mess that up, when we mess up the pH level in our gut, right. then we change what can live in there. And then that can lead to things growing that we don't want to grow. That's, exactly. That is so, that is so interesting. Yes. Wow. It's yes. global warming for your gut. Oh my <laughs> gosh. We're killing the ecosystem. <laughs> Care Lab listeners, it's Brandy, and is the founder of a platform made to make aging in place easier for everyone. I knew it would be incomplete if we did not have education, especially for caregivers. So whether you're a family caregiver or somebody who trains a whole organization, higher standards caregiver training videos are for you. I'm so proud that we were able to partner together with Amelia in order to provide these to you because they're easy for everybody. You get great occupational therapist-led training on topics like transfers and how to care for someone as they age, or maybe as things change when you have Parkinson's. So no matter if you're the loved one who doesn't know exactly what to do next because things are getting different, or if you're a professional who trains caregivers that go into the community and you need some quality education, you get both from Higher Standards Caregiver Training. And you need to check them out at higherstandardscaregivertraining.com. So, okay, this is my question. Now, as healthcare professionals, we see doctor's notes and we see things pass from one to another. And medication lists are in there almost all the time. Mm -hmm. What I don't see, though, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is the date that you started taking that medication. Yeah. And so while I might know that you're on XYZ Med, I don't know how long you've been on that. And it sounds like we need to be more aware of how long we're on things so that the trigger question can be happening. Even, I mean, the person who's taking the medicine should ask the question, like you said, do I need to be on this? But there's a lot of barriers to that sometimes. And so for some of us other healthcare professionals that are helping people, like we have no reason or way to know, like, maybe I should help them ask this question because I don't know how long you've been on that thing. So right. is there any movement around like adding those kinds of dates to medical records or are there ways that we can think about like dealing with that? Or is it really just on the patient? Unfortunately, right now it is just on the patient and their family to or their caregivers to look and be asked these questions to their physician um how how long do i need to be on this i think that that's a huge component that i want i'm trying to advocate for as well because it is important to know how long you've been on it and how long do you expect them to be on it mm -hmm. uh, and what alternatives can we give them to help them to possibly get off of it one day. We talked about, you know, the deprescribing. Um, it's such a huge thing because, like we said, the more medications you are on, the more side effects you're going to experience, and then the more meds you're going to start adding. So we want to try to prevent that because the more meds we start adding, now our quality of life has changed, and we now are in risk for other of uh, harm and adverse reactions that may be serious. So we want to really um, 
try to get off of meds as much as we can. Of course, there's some meds you may never get off of, and that's okay. Um, you need certain meds to um, for the disease process you have. But trying to work, I think that's a huge question, is asking your primary care provider or your physician, let's talk about my meds and when I can get off of some of them because I feel like I'm too, on too many. So why is deprescribing a taboo word or topic? I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, um, when it comes to medications, the one is the culture. Um, we're just thinking that mindset. Uh, we see pers um, commercials all the time. A med is helpful for this. A med is helpful for that. This one and comes with a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And great weather. Yeah. Yeah. And so we think it's all wonderful. Um, but in the, you know, once you start, I've come across many patients who are taking some of these new meds that come out and they end up with side effects that are irreversible. Mm -hmm. And it's very sad. So just to be aware of, you know, what you're putting in your body is huge. Um, you know, and not always there, there is a disclaimer at the end of the commercial that, you know, talks about the reason the, you know, serious events and this could, it could lead to death. Um, and so we need to pay attention to that. And but so there's the a puppy, picture. Rashma, the I puppy, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, I agree. I mean, it looks beautiful. It does. I agree. It does. But let's be, <laughs> let's, let's look at it as I agree. It's amazing. It's going to help you, but, and maybe short term, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you are taking a risk. Anything you put in that's chemical, that's not natural. It is a risk. And some things that are natural are a risk as well, as we know, but um, these, this is medications. It's chemically made. It's not just without harm. So we have to always be aware of that. Um, then there's the issue of um, timing with being the time you get with your physician. Um, they're not always thinking about taking medications off. Um, so they have been, and we know medical schools teach you about, and even pharmacy school, uh, we really didn't learn about deprescribing. It mm -hmm. was more like this medication is used for this and this is how it's taken. Uh, this is how it works in our body. These are the side effects. Um, but there was, you know, of course, there's recommendations on how long it should be given or it was studied for this amount of time. Um, but there's no one really thinking about, oh, OK, you've been on this med for this long, so let's take it off. Some of the common ones we know about are like our antibiotics. We know those should not be taken forever. Um, but most other meds, we don't think about that. So I think it's just putting that thought in everyone in our healthcare system and saying, let's think about, you know, what we can take off. Um, and has the patient's uh, symptoms subsided or gotten better? Can we decrease the dose? Um so I feel like there's a lot of barriers for deprescribing. There's also the patients want something. They feel that placebo effect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is huge that they feel like that, oh, if I get off of it, oh, my blood pressure will come back, you know, and it's just that mindset. So it's also helping patients understand that you can do other things to help with your blood pressure, you don't always have to be on a medication. Um, and sometimes those things are hard work, uh, whereas a medication is easy. It's easy. And that's another um, issue with deprescribing is um, they don't, they don't, you know, it's just an easy fix and people like easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And it's just also maybe with physicians and a pharmacist, you know, um, malpractice issues. So that's huge as well. Um, because, you know, if you give a medication and it helps them, you're good. Um, but if it has a side effect, I mean, 
you really can't do anything as a patient to the physician. Uh, whereas if you don't add a medication and something happens or take away a medication, now it's malpractice. Oh, that's really interesting. And I, had, I hadn't necessarily hadn't thought about it from that angle, probably because like as an occupational therapist, I can't, other than having some like scratch the level surface understanding of, of what medications do what. So I know what I'm looking at in a chart. I can't prescribe medications. I can't handle medications. I can't make recommendations for medications because it's outside, it's so far outside of my scope of practice and, and, and level of expertise. Um, so that's not really a perspective that I had thought about before, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that it was, so you would really need that patient to be on board mm -hmm. with um, what your plan is for them mm -hmm. for, with their medications and understanding that we want you to be on a optimal drug therapy with the benefit outweighing the risk. Are you on board with that? Are you, you know, and if you start experiencing symptoms, we can always add it. But let's try to keep you off of it or have alternatives. And so it's really a pay, I feel like patients who really want to live a certain lifestyle and um, try to prevent harm uh, when it or possible harm due to medication side effects or adverse events that are really unfortunate due to overuse of medication. So it's, I think, more going to be a collaboration between the patient and the physician and pharmacist to make these decisions if that's how they want to proceed. So uh, many people do want a fast fix, unfortunately. So it's not going to be for everyone right now until our healthcare system changes and there's policies implemented mm -hmm. and safeguards. And then I feel this will be easier to do. Um, but right now with the way it is, it it's definitely going to be a collaboration approach. I have one more question. If it feels like too sticky, you can dodge it. But my question is, is, is there a particular point like reason? Is there a particular reason that you could pinpoint, I guess? Um, it's okay if there's not. Why we don't also prescribe food and natural substances. So mm. for example, uh, a doctor might prescribe like vitamin C or vitamin E or something like that. But also we get that in nature from other places and our bodies absorb it f through food a lot better or maybe better is not the right word, but in, in a different way, they met metabolizes better when it comes through food or through the plant that it came from. Are there any particular reasons why that's not a part of the prescription system, if that makes sense of like, you know, mm -hmm. we'd like to have a thing, an action to take. I feel this way. I'm coming to the doctor. Help me. And then right now they give you a drug, but they could also maybe give you a prescription for some kinds of foods or some other kind of tea or some, you know, like other things. What thoughts yeah. you about that? I feel that's uh, more because um, as a pharmacist and I'm sure as a physician that, you know, just going based off of pharmacy school, we are not taught that. Mm. we are not taught food as medicine it's all about medications and this is the studies and this is what the research has shown and this is how this medication works for this disease state so this is what you prescribe and this is the treatment time um, it's really um, I think a thought that a lot of people don't come out thinking out of medical school because we're not it's, you know, I've really learned this as a pharmacist practicing um, in the environment, you know, throughout my 20 years of experience. Mm -hmm. I started realizing, um, you know, I'm obviously my parents are Indian. So we did a lot of Eastern medicine, herbals, natural things. If uh, we had a headache or leg pain or something, my mom would, you know, rub a uh, tiger balm on us or, you know, just those ease natural remedies or give us um, turmeric and honey milk, um, things like that. So I kind of already knew there was some benefit to those things. Um, and I feel our culture has always been 
medication, highly influenced by meds versus natural. So I remember when, as a, when I first came out of pharmacy school, I would be like, oh, that stuff doesn't work, mom. You know, just, you know, we just take a medicine, you know, because mm-hmm. I came out of pharmacy school. So yeah, I'm mm-hmm. like, that. you know, and then I started seeing the harms of medications and side effects. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe this is not as good as I thought. And um, then I went back to seeing what my parents did and realized there was benefit from it. It's just not the immediate benefit or Mm -hmm. the, you know, it takes longer to see benefit from a, uh, something we put in like food versus a medicine. Medicine, you're going to feel pain relief right away. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, not changing your diet or exercising, you may not see that relief for a little while. So, um, you know, I feel that's one reason why is that we're just not taught that, mm-hmm. and um, the relief of that is a lot. It just takes a lot longer to see relief or symptoms subside due to food. It, the time frame is longer and not people, not everyone I think is willing to do certain things to, um, you know, help them decrease, let's say blood pressure. Like I know a lot of, um, cardiologists or even primary care doctors will ask, you know, when they first start seeing high blood pressure, they'll say, okay, let's try a diet, low salt diet for, six months and then come and see me majority of the patients end up you know not uh, doing the low salt diet and their blood pressure is high still and they start meds Mm -hmm. so I feel the importance of it or you know I, I feel there should be um more guidance to the patient when it comes to advocating for other way, non-pharmacological approaches to management of their disease state, because we may just offer, for example, the low salt diet, but does the patient really understand what that means? That's Well, that's what I was just going to say. Yeah, it's like, not really. I think all of this comes around to being an education issue, right? Because like yes. you could say low salt diet, but does the does the patient know that when they read a label that sodium is the same thing as salt and they might not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so if they might think that they're on a low salt diet because they're not salting their food and not putting salt on it. Yes. But they're actually still eating a ton of salt because there's so much sodium in the processed food that they're eating. So I think, and, and I don't think that that means people like people aren't dumb. I really truly believe that. I think people are smart. But if you don't give them the information that they need to make good decisions, then it's very difficult to make those yeah. those yeah. good decisions. And we can't assume based on our knowledge that other people, that what we're saying makes any sense at all, because Correct. it probably doesn't. Like we yeah. have to think about it from their perspective. We have to be willing to take a little longer in a conversation right? to have them talk to us. And listen to what we're hearing instead of just us talking at them and mm-hmm. giving and giving information, you know. So I think and I, I I mean, partly I think that as an occupational therapist, that's one of the things that I try to do a lot because I don't I don't have meds in my like that's not in my pocket, is something that I can give out. Everything that I quote unquote, prescribe or recommend for someone is going to be a functional approach. It's going to be about it it, because I can't use meds. That's not in my pocket. So it has to be about lifestyle changes, behavioral changes, modifications. How are we going to do X, Y, and Z? And it is really hard, as you pointed out, Mm. to get people to do those things. It's really hard, but it makes it a lot easier if you actually tell them why and they understand the why. And then it's like, oh, wait, you mean if I if I change this habit, I'm going to feel better like all the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. people can get on board with it. But I think so often it comes down to this idea of are we really truly educating people in a way that yes. is speaking to them? And that's why I think the, the work that you're doing is so is so important 
because you you are having those kinds of conversations with people about their medicines and really helping them understand the nuts and bolts of of you know this isn't just a thing that you put into your mouth it's something that you're an active participant in and let's let's understand this better together yeah yeah for sure Yes, it's so important to have these conversations. And the other point I wanted to make about um, educating as well as follow up. There's no follow up after we yeah. talk to them uh, and make a recommendation of a low salt diet. Um, I feel it's so important to have a, a caregiver, uh, the physician or nurse call the patient and say, Hey, how's it going? And do you have questions about your diet? How can we help you? Uh, because it's not as easy, like you said, um, as, Oh, just two grams of salt a day. Okay. I don't, you know, and yeah. we could actually help prevent medications being added by just that one phone call and having the opportunity for questions. Well, Reshma, thank you so much yeah, for so being much. on Care Lab. I actually, I there's so much more that I think we could talk yeah. about. I would love to have you back again in the future if you're up for that, because there are yes. like so many rabbit holes that I wanted to go down today that I didn't go down because I didn't want to derail everything. Um, but I would love to have you back. We would love to have you back if you if you yes. are up for it. Yes, this was awesome, and I'm so glad you guys invited me. This was a great journey and I'm glad I got to educate a little bit and talk about what I love. Well, listener, if you enjoyed the episode, please make sure that you are liking and clicking that little button to subscribe so that you get updates on whenever the next Care Lab podcast drops, which is by the way, every Friday. Every just Friday, in case, not every secret. Friday, just in case you didn't know, um, make sure that you're sharing this with other folks who you think could benefit from the information. And we will see you next time right here on Care Lab. Bye. Bye. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network.